In the previous lesson, we started looking at the concept of the separation of powers in the United Kingdom, and we explored this as a fundamental building block, a, a, a fundamental principle of the UK's constitutional setting. In this lesson, we're going to move on to the next major principle, which is this idea of the rule of law. And we're going to explore the rule of law in two lessons. We'll talk about the rule of law in its generality in this lesson. And then we will talk about the rule of law more specifically in relation to the works of A.V. Dicey in the next lesson. So we've been examining the various different principles of the UK constitution. Uh, we looked specifically with reference to the doctrine of the separation of powers, the way in which this applies to the UK's constitutional framework. Um, in this lesson, we're going to explore the next of these major principles. This is the idea of the rule of law in more detail. So as we noted in our lessons on the English legal system, uh, the rule of law is a particularly difficult thing to define precisely. Um, for those of you who want to have a basic overview of this, um, go over to our lessons on the English legal system that we've done already. But it's true, it is difficult to define precisely what the rule of law actually entails. Now, the majority of legal theorists, um, what they do in, instead is talk not about trying to define the rule of law by just giving us a simple definition, but instead try to highlight a number of the basic qualities that the rule of law entails. So looking at the different things that the rule of law encompasses rather than looking at a specific and strict definition of the rule of law. So we'll be focusing the majority of our time looking at some of those basic principles which have been elucidated by constitutional theorists. So ultimately, if we take a leaf out of um, the work of uh, Joseph Raz from 1977, we can see that there are a number of principles that can be said to encompass the rule of law. Now, for the most part, you would see broad agreement among many constitutional theorists about whether or not uh, each of these principles um, actually do form part of the rule of law. Um, at least there is a general consensus that um, there is uh, that, 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 that the rule of law is encompassing at least some of these principles. OK, so things like the principle of prospectivity in law, um, the principle of stability of law, the principle of clear and concise lawmaking, the idea of an independent judiciary the concept of natural justice, the idea of judicial review, judicial accessibility, as well as checks on state authorities. These come from Joseph Raz, as cited by Partworth in 2020. So these are basic conceptions of what really solidifies the basic understanding of what the rule of law is. We are talking about the idea that the rule, uh, that, 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 rule uh, that law sorry, should be um, prospective. It should be clear when lawmaking is done. There should be an independent judiciary that is able to adjudicate over um, various legal disputes. There should be the idea of natural justice as well as checks on state authorities. So Given this is the case, let's look at what some of these mean in more detail. Um, uh, we won't go through all of them because some of them are particularly very easy to understand. So, for example, clear lawmaking or an independent judiciary. These are things that are quite easy. Some of the things that are a little bit more complicated are things like natural justice, for example. And, as I've cited here, the concept of prospectivity of law. The idea that law has to be prospective essentially prohibits the idea that law can be retrospective. That is the the idea here. Okay, it could be you could you could essentially uh, define this principle uh, either in the positive or the negative. You could say um, law has to be prospective, or that law should not be retrospective. It ought to not be retrospective. What does retrospectivity mean when we talk about law? Well, I could not. And you should not be able to pass a law tomorrow which outlaws a com an act that is committed today, but then go on to prosecute individuals for that action. OK, so you can't retrospectively go back and start prosecuting people who committed crimes when at the time it wasn't a crime. So if I if, if <clears throat> for example, um, uh, there was a, a repealing of all the abortion laws in the United Kingdom, everything to do with abortion laws, it was now outlawed completely. We lived in a. Uh, in a in a in a very um, deeply religious uh, Catholic um, state, and it became the case that um, that the abortions was illegal. The state should not then be able to go back and find every single person who has um, aided in, in 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 giving abortions or or who has actually gone and had an abortion and then gone and prosecute all of those people because at the time they were not 
crimes. And at the time, they were not um, committing uh, an, an act that violated the law. It's only now that they are doing so. So the idea that law should be not should not be retrospective is a very basic principle. The common law has consistently made it clear that law is not retrospective. Um, for example, in the case in 1870 of Phillips and Irie, um, we have this idea that retrospective laws are no doubt on its face of questionable policy and contrary to the general principle that legislation by which the conduct of mankind is to be regulated ought, when introduced for the first time, to deal with future acts, and ought not to change the character of the past transactions carried upon the faith of the then existing law. So when a new law is passed, it is going to regulate the future. It does not regulate uh, previous actions that had been committed by individuals. Retrospective law making is also not just only um, a violation of principles from the common law, it is also a violation of Article 7 of the European Convention on Human Rights, for which the United Kingdom is still a member at the time of recording, and I'm recording this lesson on the 20th of October 2023, uh, and at the moment we are still uh, members of the Council of Europe and the ECHR. So what about the idea of openness in lawmaking? Well, this idea essentially tells us that the law must not be vague, or it must not be inaccessible, or it must not be uncertain when it is being made. The law must be such that people are able to understand and follow the rules which are being put in place. OK, so there shouldn't be any kind of um, really, really difficult to understand, convoluted, inaccessible um, and uncertain um, ways in which the law should operate. It should be very, very easy. This not only fits into the concept of the rule of law, but it also fits into the concept of the logic of law. Law should be logical and coherent, and it should be very clear that the rules uh, that are in place are the rules that are um, very easy to understand. And this is why, by the way, whenever somebody tells me that doing a law degree is very, very difficult or that law is somehow a very complicated subject, I would um, come back to them and say that the thing about law is it is supposed to be very, very clear, very, very accessible and very, very certain in the way that it operates. That's not to suggest that it isn't and it's not to suggest that there aren't complexities that exist when studying law. But for the most part, it is quite easy. OK, and that is not only a, 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 a principle of sort of the logic of law from a philosophical perspective, but it is also a principle of the rule of law in this way as well. Again, according to Partworth from 2020, in order for people to understand what it is that the law requires them to do or refrain from doing, it is necessary that the law is free from ambiguity and uncertainty. If you don't know whether or not you have to perform a certain act in a certain way because you don't know what the law actually says because it is uncertain as to what the actual rule is intended, then that is a violation of the rule of law. Continuing on then, what about the principle of natural justice? What does this actually mean? Well, natural justice is just the general principle that individuals have a right to a fair hearing on account of what is being accused. So... This is essentially the, the, the right to a fair trial, uh, the right to a fair, uh, a fair accounting of the facts, a fair accounting of what has been accused with the absence of any kind of bias. Um, it pertains mainly to the idea of the fair and free judicial process, which of course instills a number of further principles, such as things like the right to a fair trial the right to a trial in, in, in and of itself, um, the presumption of innocence at trial, and the following of, of, of proper and effective uh, judicial procedures. In addition to principles of natural justice, it should also be noted that the judiciary ought to be completely independent, and it should be free from bias, which sort of fits into a principle of natural justice that we previously explored. If the government is able to influence the decisions of the judiciary, then this suggests that they would not be able to properly deliver the rule of law in cases where the government may be a defendant, which is actually quite a lot of the case uh, and a lot of the time. The government is a defendant, especially within uh, administrative law and judicial review procedures. There's lots of examples where the government represents um, or, or is, is either a claimant or a defendant in judicial cases. This is achieved through a number of mechanisms, this idea of judicial independence, so things like security of tenure, security of pay, um, the, the sort of uh, obligation to ensure that pay is, is um, uh, fixed and there is no uh, question of bribery. 
Finally, then, let's think about what access to justice means. So the, in the ability for an individual to gain access to justice is an important part of the rule of law. Um, the case of uh, the Crown and the uh, Wiltham, uh, and Wiltham, the Lord Chancellor, um, says that access to the courts is a constitutional right. It can only be denied by the government if it persuades Parliament to pass legislation which specifically permits the executive to turn people away from the court door. This is quite interesting because it says here that ultimately access to court, access to justice is a constitutional right. And many would argue that this fits into the broader narrative of the rule of law. But then they qualify it and they say that we can only deny access to justice. We can only deny this principle if the government is able to get parliament to pass legislation. And this really ties into the question of which of the uh, which of these principles is most important, because what this is saying here is that it is highlighting a principle of the rule of law, but then it is talking about how this rule of law principle can be uh, trampled on in the face of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. The idea that if the government uh, wants to deny the right of an individual to access justice, they can only do so by getting the uh, parliament to pass legislation. So that sort of brings you, gives you a bit of an idea as to the position of parliamentary sovereignty in this broader conversation, of which is, which is the next principle that we're going to get to in future lessons time. In the previous lesson, we outlined the rule of law as a basic principle of the UK constitution and the UK's constitutional framework. This lesson is going to examine a very, very famous interpretation of the rule of law coming from arguably one of the greatest constitutionalists and constitutional theorists that we've ever had in the UK, this obviously being A.V. Dicey. We're going to talk about what A.V. Dicey interprets the rule of law to be and to mean, and we'll explain the importance of this interpretation. So... The last lesson looked at the rule of law in a more general uh, framework, talking about the difficulty getting some kind of definition, talking about Joseph Raz's um, perception of the rule of law and a number of the different characteristics, talking about the fact that when we come to define the rule of law, we actually spend more of time looking at different things that the rule of law could be and some of the elements of the rule of law rather than trying to come up with a specific and a coherent and contingent definition itself that is that is um, perfectly um, self-sustaining. Well, in the same way that we looked at Joseph Raz's uh, theories of the rule of law in the previous lesson, this lesson is going to look at A.V. Dicey's theory of the rule of law. It's a little bit more simple. There's a few less um, characteristics that Dicey associates with the concept of the rule of law. Um, and ultimately, in his um, part two of uh, his introduction to the study of the law of the Constitution from 1885, one of the four mentioned cited works of constitutional theory in the United Kingdom, in fact, arguably one of the major sources of the UK's constitution, which we'll get to in the future, um, what A.V. Dicey does is elucidate what he believes to be just three major principles which essentially codify and enshrine the rule of law. Uh, and these three main principles are um, as follows. Um, we will get to them in a second, but ultimately um, he himself understood the rule of law um, to be one of, if not the most important and one of the most fundamental principles of the UK constitution. Now, there's sometimes a bit of back and forth, a bit of debate about what comes before uh, the, the other uh, between the rule of law and the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, and there are lots of different arguments for why the rule of law is more important than parliamentary sovereignty. There are lots of arguments why parliamentary sovereignty is more important than the rule of law. But suffice it to say that sovereignty of parliament and the rule of law are the two most important principles, arguably, of the UK constitution. The three fundamental principles of the rule of law, then, are elucidated as follows by A.V. Dicey. He argues that, firstly, no one should be punished except for a violation of the law. Part two is that nobody is above the law, the law is equal. And then part three relates to the supremacy of the ordinary law. OK, those are the three principles. So better than uh, Joseph Raz's uh, seven, eight, nine or ten principles that, that sort of um, encompass ideas relating to the rule of law. Um, we only have to deal with three principles and uh, have to talk about them in a little bit more detail. So principle one is that no one should be punished except for a violation of the law. This is the view, essentially, that the law should not be imposing arbitrary restrictions, arbitrary power over the citizenry without the due process of law. 
It's very, very simple. Arbitrary power is subordinate to the authority of the law. This elucidated um, some basic principles that we see in not only the glorious revolution of 1688, when Parliament invites William of Orange to, to essentially rule over and reign, um, uh, replacing uh, James II, it also uh, is elucidated in the first um, two articles of the eighteen, uh, sorry, of the sixteen eighty nine Bill of Rights, and it makes complete sense. You shouldn't be subjected to the force of the law without the due process of the law. Okay, there is a sort of yin and yang that exists within the concept of law itself that tells us that a violation of the law is the only uh, con is a condition for the uh, enforcement of of of, of arbitrary of, of power at least over the law because otherwise it would be arbitrary law cannot be arbitrary therefore there has to be this due process of law that exists in addition to the due process of law and the lack of arbitrariety of law, we also have the idea of the equality of law. OK, um, the law uh, means uh, sorry, the law ought to be applied equally to every person. That's what the law is equal refers to the idea of the equality of law. Very, very simple. OK, not only does this entail that no person is above the law but it also entails that there is no bias or arbitrary discrimination of individuals who are uh, under the law um, the itself so not only is there some is there no such thing as a person who exists outside of the law but also for everybody who exists inside of the law there is no discrimination on the basis of arbitrary bias okay now there's a little bit of debate about this one because ultimately and theoretically you could make the argument that the monarch is above the law because the monarch is the person who um, to, to, to which all of uh, legal authority and sovereignty comes from they are the sovereign uh, but the extent to which the monarch can actually break the law um, is debatable because even though theoretically the sovereign exists as above the law uh, you have the fact that the the power of the sovereign is where law enforcement comes from. You have things like the Crown Prosecution Service. When you have a criminal case, it is the Crown versus the defendant. But if the monarch was to actually break the law, uh, it would spark quite an interesting constitutional debate and the question of whether or not the law is actually um, something that the monarch is subjected to is one that it's sort of a, a, a grey area in terms of the constitution. It's a murky ground that um, ultimately we may have to just wait and see if the monarch ever does break the law uh, as to whether or not um, it actually uh, applies equally. The final principle then is the idea of supremacy of ordinary law. This is the view that the general principles of the constitution are derived from the ordinary law. At the time, this represented the law of judicial decisions, the, the judge-made law of the, of the common law, essentially. And essentially, what A.V. Dicey does is note that this is particularly true, regardless of whether or not the particular law is actually good or bad. So the argument here goes that Dicey is rejecting the notion that there exists some higher authority within the UK constitution. And so he is rejecting the idea that there is some kind of higher entrenched legal system that would exist in, for example, a codified document like the U.S. Constitution. So in recognizing that there is no codified constitution in the U.K. and therefore there is no uh, higher constitutional law that exists similar to that of the, the provisions of the U.S. Constitution, that means, therefore, that the ordinary law that is non-constitutional is supreme. That is where the highest source of authority uh, begins and ends. At the time, this is representative of, 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 the, of the common law because legislation wasn't as, um, as pertinent at the time. But it could also be representative as, as the idea and the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. Um, sort of elucidating parliamentary sovereignty in this principle, but also making it very clear that the the point of this uh, point, essentially, the point of this principle is that there is no delineation between ordinary law and higher law. Ordinary law is the supremacy, uh, is the supreme um, kind of law that exists.